I went to go see a brilliant movie this weekend, but I came out with a crappy cop. <laughs> there can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. All out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello and welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and along with me are my awesome film aficionados here on the screen, just for your viewing pleasure. This time I'm recording instead of Morgan. Yay! Video podcast time! Oh. Jazz hands. I'm so excited. I am. I'm excited. <laughs> um, so let's uh let's see, who should I introduce first? Let's see, um, Hey, let's go reverse this time. Um, this man, he's a cool guy, and he's Morgan Ledger. Hello, everyone, and I'd like to say to all my friends in Japan out there, Winding Jai, Winding Douche. <laughs> Next up, we have the Canadian of the North, Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. Hey, guys, how's it going? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I just want to go hide. <laughs> How about this? Where did the hair go? Oh yeah. Where did the hair, the hair go? go? <laughs> Where did the hair go? <laughs> <laughs> that I was saving so, it. I need to. Oh my god! I need to play that song every time mm. I get a haircut now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh my god. And and. I live the couch. <laughs> yes. And last but not least, the man who came late, but that's okay. He celebrated a birthday party with a friend. His name is James Sullivan, also known as Hamitude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by... The fridge was that? I don't know. Thank you. Sorry, I had a taco today. <laughs> Get my brown pants. <laughs> As from that indication, we're talking about giant monster films. And let me say that along with giant monster films, there's a little subgenre category called um, creature features, which includes creatures that attack as well as giant monsters. Um, as a couple of people about this, um, I told James that He's like, oh, good point. I told Matt this, and he's. We had this little argument about it. Well, it's just I don't know. It's like if you're gonna go with creature features, then you. It's like you got so many like different kind of creatures. You got like the like. Well, then we'll we're gonna go into the aliens, and then we're gonna go into like all, all the different things like the the discovery. I don't know, discovering a weird thing, or like I, I don't know. It's just like it's like it's like if we're gonna go giant monsters, go with giant monsters. I don't know. That's how I. That's how I feel. That, that's how. I mean, I was and I typed in. I went to Wikipedia. I typed in uh, monster films, and in the description was like, uh, monster films quotation creature feature or giant monster films, and I'm like, oh, I was right. <laughs> Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, but like a tiny alien is not a giant no, no, monster. No. It, 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 uh, creature features don't don't have aliens. I, I I'm not saying creature features. I mean giant monsters. It's not. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, I I just wanted to mention that for the viewers. Mm -hmm. Just just random stuff. Um. But I, uh, I don't. Uh, never mind. Agree to disagree. 
Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I feel like if we if we we're gonna enter into things like aliens, like that could be an, e- an entire episode of its it, own. It will be an entire episode. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, that's because we're, awesome. we're not gonna talk about aliens in this episode. Oh. Ah. No aliens. aliens. No. Uh, oh. Unless it's a, it's a giant alien. Sad. Yep. 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 Sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, speaking of giant aliens, let me get this out of the way before we go into the major, major giant monster films. I would like to talk about a unconventional giant monster that is not um, very talked about. I mean, it's, it's good in pop culture, but nobody ever talks about Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. No, because nobody's seen it anymore, I don't think. The original or the remake with Alec Baldwin? Um, was Alec was Alec Baldwin the fifty foot woman? No, no, no. It no, was no. the it was a nineties remake where she gets contaminated by alien goo and her boyfriend's like, uh, oh, the fifties version. Never mind. Uh, this is this is the remake right here. Oh, that's the remake. Well, that's the remake. I, I got the remake in my hands. Um, so. Yeah. When I talk about it's both the original, the remake, and the the other two. Um, the original features a a giant alien coming to Earth, zaps this rich lady, and she grows into a giant woman, and she rampages through the city pretty much. The remake doesn't feature a giant alien; it just shows a spaceship going. Bzz, beep, boop. <laughs> We're gonna fuck around this person for no reason. Ha ha ha! I'm done. So, it's the same thing happens in the remake, but the remake is just. Uh. uh, Not as good as the original. I mean, it's just. They they shoved, like, the whole feminist thing in the damn movie. It's like, Uh oh, I am a feminist. I'm dominant. Oh, God, yeah. Of course it would go into that. But, uh. It wasn't Alec Baldwin. It was his brother. Damn. Oh, the, oh, the, the, uh, the, the kind of like the bootleg version of Alec Baldwin who played Barney and Viva Rock Vegas. No, 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 no. That was no. Oh shit. You're you're thinking of Stephen Baldwin. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was his brother. Was he? He's got another brother and I can't think of his name. Joe. Frank Paul. No, it's Dan, I think, Daniel Baldwin. Daniel Baldwin, that is Daniel Baldwin. Yeah, it's not even on the DVD cover. They just list Daniel, Daryl Hannah on the cover, and that's it. No other cast. I mean, that is the 50-foot woman. Exactly. So, yeah, the Tech of the 50-foot woman made this huge pop culture phenomenon because it's featured in TV shows, cartoons, music videos. And so... In 1995, uh, we got something better than a a 50 foot woman. (laughs) We got Attack of the 60 foot centerfold. Centerfold. (laughs) Oh my. Oh, you. Fridge. That's a better shot of the cover right there. Angel is the centerfold. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, because the character's name is Angel. (laughs) Nice. It is? Whoa. Ooh. Yeah, the joke, comes, the joke comes full circle. It is. Because <laughs> it is. It's actually... Debbie, did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> nice. Whoa. Oh, my God. This is awesome. I oh. love doing video chats. Oh, yeah. I love this. This is the okay. best. This is the yeah. best one now. Um, so, anyways... The Attack of the 60-Foot Centerfold is a parody of the original film. A parody. So basically what happens in Attack of the 50-Foot Centerfold, a centerfold is, um, you know, what you see in Playboy, you know, the centerfold, you fold out. Oh. So sh- there, there is a bunch of girls that sh- uh, are doing a shoot, a photo shoot, and they go to this mansion. I don't even know what, there's, there's this knockoff Playboy bunny kind of thing, and they go there... Like a penthouse video or something? Something like that. And um, Angel, the main character in the film, is um, she's like taking this uh, formula that's making her more beautiful and more hotter. 
and this formula. She keeps drinking it, drinking it, and all of a sudden she grows taller and taller and taller, becoming 60 feet tall. And they have to figure out how to get her back to normal. And there's no attacking until all the end of the damn film where the rival of Angel gets pissed off. She drinks some the formula and she grows big as well. And they fight in at the end in Los Angeles. Wait a minute. Wasn't this produced by Roger Corman? Yes. Uh, yeah. That, uh, can ex- that explains it. Un- uncredited produced by Roger Corman. He was he actually he... that uh, embarrassed by one of his own projects. He was uncredited. Yeah, because <laughs> if you if you look anywhere about this, it is, if you look at IMDb, it says uncredited. But the funny thing about Roger Corman is that um, he came back, uh, was it a couple of years ago, with a, his first 3D picture called Attack of the 50-Foot Cheerleader, which is essentially a remake of this film. I heard they had a scene remake near the end where there's two giant cheerleaders attacking each other and they're both topless. Yes. Okay, that, that's the version I wanted to make sure. Yes, that's the Attack of the 50 Foot Cheerleader. Um, so Attack of the 50 Foot Cheerleader is basically Attack of the 50 Foot Centerfold instead of it sets in college and cheerleaders. And it has the same formula, kind of inducing growing. And it does have a cameo of Roger Corman and John Landis in it. Mm, interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, so, <laughs> yeah, bliss. Um, so the cameos. Um, Roger Corman plays the dean of the college. He he's visiting a class, and John Landis is a teacher. And the scene is um, the character's name is Cassie, and she dr- drank the formula, and she's growing, and she's um, she has a bun on, and she's growing, and her top buttons open to expose her breasts and the button flies in the air and pokes John Lannis in the eye. <laughs> and she's like, ow, 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 And all the kids in the class are just taking pictures and filming it. It's like, ah, son of a bitch, fuck, ah, ah, ah. Wait, what are they taking pictures of? Like, the John Landis with his eye hurt, or? With the, with the eye hurt. Because it's so funny. <laughs> um... Mm. It's not like John Landis hasn't had hard enough luck anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Um, have you seen Bur- Have you seen Burke and Harry recently? <laughs> um. But yeah, the, actually, part British of the ma- movie, part of the main cast of the Tag of for Cheerleader is um, oh, um, Ted Raimi, is in it. Hmm. And um, oh fuck, what was the other guy? <laughs> there was another well-known B movie actor, <laughs> but. I mean, honestly, I love the uh, Attack of the 50 Foot series. I mean, come on, giant women. Come on. Come on, giant boobs. I haven't seen them yet. I'm kind of ashamed. Scooter, Scooter, are you a macrophile? (laughs) No, he's just a little offended. You have to call him Mixtape now. He's not Scooter. He's Mike Mixtape now. Thank you, Matt. Mike Mixtape, are you into macro? Almost a save there. Almost a save. I guess I should drop that other character now. Anyways, moving on. I'm not answering that question, by the way. That's a a secret. (laughs) I'm just saying. That's no secret from me, boy. Now you guys know, all right? Now you guys know. That's also, cool. That's why you mentioned it. Oh. oh. I guess um, uh, I'll actually start uh, just to make the ball rolling. Um, one thing that I want to mention just a little bit on my side is that right now I'm working on, uh, as you guys know, I'm working on animation look back, the best of stop motion. Hmm. One of which I'm actually checking on is um, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm actually checking on the works of Ray Harryhausen. Not Yay! necessarily animated, but um, very a vital piece of stop motion history. So I have to check him out. So uh, pretty much, I'm just starting into it. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, My emer is pleased. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you have a happy emer. Yes. Um, I haven't used him in a while, but go on. 
I'm just in the middle of, I'm pretty much in the middle of writing, but uh, one thing that I interestingly discovered, like, as you may know, he does a lot of big monster movies. Now, you could practically say that all of his, almost all of his movies are, like, feature big monsters, but not all of which are necessarily, like, the main feature. Like, you wouldn't say, like, uh, the Sinbad movies or Clash of the Titans are necessarily giant monster movies because excuse me, the giant monster is not really the main monster. But the one that I want to mention is pretty much the first film he's he worked on, which he's of, like he's the official head of the uh, stop motion animation, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which is based on a Ray Bradbury short story. Mm. What's really interesting about The Beast of, the Fath- of um, 20,000 Fathoms is, um, is something that you might find familiar. Because of a nuclear testing in the Arctic, uh, a giant dinosaur suddenly is like he has awoken. And there is one, per- like, there's a professor who noticed that, like, there's a giant mom. There's, like, a giant lizard coming. And, like, you see him going, like, destroying ships, and he destroyed a lighthouse. And then suddenly he comes into New York, to New York and starts crashing it. Does that sound familiar? Giant monster coming into a big city destroys a lot of things you could say oh isn't that a ripoff not a ripoff actually one of the inspirations of it that's the interesting thing so i thought it would be interesting so i thought it would be interesting to mention that it's like it's kind of a bit of a precursor to the big monster we all know and love like as one of the original sources yep Yep. and his name was mothra Uh, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, to see no, that. No, no, no. His his name was Reptilicus. No, no, no. His <laughs> his name was Gamera. No, no, guys, you got it all wrong. It's the claw, you know, the thing that says. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! It's the giant claw, yes. the flying battleship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that, definitely, Matt. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah definitely. Uh, that, like, definitely, this is something that, that I would highly suggest both for big, giant monster fans and for, um, and for, uh, for Ray, of course, Ray Harryhausen fans and for special effects people and mm. for stop motion fans. Because this may seem a bit generic today because it's just giant lizard in a big city, but it is kind of a bit of a... A vital piece of hit of uh, history, plus the fact that it's one of the first that uses dynamation, which is a very interesting process. It's a little complicated to explain, but if you actually do it in practice, it makes a lot more sense. Is that like animating dinosaurs? Uh, no, 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 no. It's a uh, it's a way that you can in like you can integrate stop motion into live action footage. Like you can have some live action foot footage in the foreground and like in the middle like background ish you have like the stop motion monster coming oh okay well yeah we'll look forward to that and so yeah so anyone else who wants to go next he i guess to add on to um Ray Harryhausen, there's a small collection I have that I got at um, when I was working at a movie stop. And it's that um, collection of films where it's like they're colorized or something. It's actually right over there on the shelf. It's, yeah. if I remember correctly, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers. Um, it came from Beneath the Sea, which is about a giant octopus. Mm-hmm. And, of course, 20 million miles to Earth. <laughs> And I'll never forget, you know, getting this package and getting this guy with it. Um, just, I like to think of him as Kraken Senior. <laughs> yes, I, I'm trying to remember. They, they couldn't call him the Emer for some reason in the movie, even though it's supposed to be based on North uh, Norse mythology. Um, it's it's some other creature. I can't remember what. Um, but the thing you find interesting about Ray Harryhausen's creatures is that they have this very distinctive godlike structure almost like sort of something adjacent to pre-mythology. And this is sort of an interview Ray Harryhausen mentioned once, I think on the Clash of the Titans DVD, that he was always about the past. He always loved going to the past, nothing about the future. And 
he, he's seen stuff like Metropolis before, and he likes things like that. But he thinks it's more interesting going back into um, the realms of mythology and just um, presenting it for what it is. And that's why we have so many classics like Clash of the Titans um, and a few Clash others. Clash of the Titans, the Sinbad right. movies. Yep, Sinbad. Um, the Golden Fleet. Uh, Jason and the Argonauts. Jason and the Argonauts. Jason. Oh, my God, of course. Talos. <laughs> Jason and the Argonauts. Um also, one of them I just discovered, The Village of Guanji. I don't know why nobody is making a movie of this right now. Cowboys versus dinosaurs. Because cowboys and aliens happened. Well, there's cowboys and aliens, but we have cowboys and dino- dinosaurs. Yeah. Still, I feel really bad for this model. As you can tell, over the years, it's had a bit of a chipping, so... Mm. This guy's been really hard to keep around. I, I remember Ooh. I was filming an episode, and I accidentally slipped in the first thing it went was the hand and then it fell off the shelf is it is it made of glass or what is it made of um it's some sort of plaster scene it's i'm de- it's sort of the same kind of plaster scene made with these guys here but it's a little uh, more lighter and it's not as heavy so okay i think i yeah i think i yeah i get what you mean yeah i think i have one of those things it, it's something like that but no the thing with um Monster films in the vein of that, you're just marveling at the special effects and how they meld in with the live action material. Um, another one being it came from beneath the sea, how a giant, you know, octopus can just literally cause so much havoc and chaos. I remember when they were advertising the movie, they didn't want any mention of the Golden Gate Bridge or even any destruction mm-hmm. of it. I was about to say that because, like, it was new and they don't want to strike fear mm-hmm. or relate to over the fact that, like, the gold, they, they they don't want to say that the Golden Gate Bridge is pretty much like made out of cardboard and like any little thing that can happen, it could just go. You know? Yeah. So it, it's really interesting to see how they could do that meshing of animation and live action at the same time. And of course, you had the big bug movies, which mm-hmm. were the Hi. fear of my childhood. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like them or Eight Legged Freaks or stuff like that. I hated that movie, Eight Legged Freaks. Oh. oh yeah i remember when it came out it's like it was pretty much i guess it was like you could say it's like the sharknado of the early 2000s because it was about giant spiders and oh. like be, because okay. like it's the number one thing that people love to tease all the arachnophobia uh, arachnophobians yeah. I, I guess you want to know okay. the movie's you want to know the movie's original title and this is true what what I am going to pronounce it at the best of my ability because if I mispronounce it, you'll mistake it for something else. It was originally to be called Iraq Attack. Uh. <laughs> oh. You can mm-hmm. see why they changed it. Interesting. <laughs> well, you better, okay, because like you better pronounce it correctly or else it would sound like a good thing. <laughs> You see protesters outside. This is a politically challenged movie. How dare they? Dude, it's about giant spiders. Um, it's metaphorical. Oh, we are being ripped oh, by oh, the spiders. spiders. Oh, oh, okay. A giant legion of spiders. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That whole <laughs> movie is just spiders. It's a giant legion of spiders. Here, here's here's my tiff. They try to make it sort of like a gremlins sort of spree with it, but it's way too stupid and self-aware. There's too many wings to the camera. If you look at the bug movies of the past, like Earth versus the Spider, or um, I'm trying to think, there's another a Tarantula, if I remember correctly. Oh, I just the, right. yeah. Yeah, those movies held up because they had a very serious tone to them and you're so engaged into how they can take something so legitimately serious and it's because of the fact that how they're playing it in tone style and atmosphere and it works here they're obviously going for a take on that but it's way too stupid it's way too self-aware it's like they're legitimately going yeah we're fighting giant spiders this is scary isn't it the scene where they're driving on mopeds or whatever it is through the desert, and the things are just hopping around everywhere. I lost it. I said, I'm done with you, movie. I am done with you. Wait, 
Just boing, 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 boing. The wolf thing about tiggers. The wolf thing about fighters. The wolf thing about playing. The top of the bottom of the bottom. The bottom of the bottom of the swing. They got a leg. The bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom uh, so, but yeah, I think, I think uh, that I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Squish. Actually, no. <laughs> Not. That, but I, I want to get uh, before before we get uh, too far far away from this uh, this particular train of, of thought. I want to uh, uh, um, uh, bring up something, Matt. You you compared the film to Sharknado. Uh, uh, being the Sharknado of its time, uh, I think this brings up a, a very interesting point. I think I think that there's two things that I would I would really boil down to uh, that can either make or break your monster movie. The first is having a point or a heart to it. The other is craft. Um. With uh, with the uh, with eight legged freaks, there wasn't a point to it, except uh, but there, but there was, there was a lot of craft, obviously. Mm. I mean, uh, I I the one uh, you can you can trash the film all you want me. I just sort of say, like ask me on any given day of the week, but I will tell you this: um, the one scene that disturbed me. The cat in the wall. You too. You too? It it wouldn't it would have been hilarious if it was not for the fact that this oh, yeah. the the voice actor the voice actor just sounded like oh he was so in so much pain. The dog in ice cream man had more dignity than that. Oh yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I I don't want to see the cat get tortured, please. Yeah, it's pretty much yeah. It's kind of like in the. Uh, it's like in the. I think it was like a, a sequel to the Blob. I think mm-hmm. where like you yes, just see this cute. Little, yeah, yeah. You just see this cute little kitty, and then suddenly. Yeah, pick a tone for your movie if you're gonna go for campy. I and laugh. Ding, stick with it. Tonight, pussy tonight. <laughs> oh, Morgan. It's the Blob. What do you expect? Yeah. You know, speaking of which, um, I actually, I actually see the Blob on the list. See, like, we can also talk about that. Like, whether yeah. it be like the regular version or the remake, is it a? No, it's not a. The remake is not a. Who is it? A John Carpenter. It's no, not John Carpenter, no, is it? No, no, you're, you're thinking of the thing. No, 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 I know, but it, like, I, I feel like. Um, like when it when uh, the blob was remade, it has a very similar feel to it, where like it's like really emphasis on the gore now, and like when you see the blob eating people, you, like you literally see the people like decompose. Mm. I'm trying to think the special effects guy who did those movies. Uh, what? Um, well, it could be the same special effects guy. Yeah. Let's see, it's uh, Chuck Russell. That's Chuck Russell. Who made the movie. Really? Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah, it was Rob Bodden who did the special effects for the thing. Tony Gardner did um, the blob. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but yeah, the most of the most of the best of the best monster movies have had uh, sort of a sort of a point to begin with. I think uh, with King Kong, it was. Uh, it was a very simple point about man, man, man's relationship with nature, which has been, which has been copied over and over and over and over. Uh, with um, with some of the, with some of the uh, '50s monster movies like uh, them, uh, is is them the one with the giant underground ants? Yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah, that. Damn, damn. That's uh, that was the the whole uh, uh, and that was the whole nuclear energy theme, I if I memory recalls. But some people, mm-hmm. actually, funny story. Uh, um, I had a college professor 
uh, who is uh, uh, who is repeating someone else's thesis, trying to trying to actually say that them was not just uh, a warning about nuclear energy, but also uh, I, but also uh, a metaphor for the communist uh, invasion or the communist influence. Uh, yes, yes, watch them like the cockroaches they are. Oh, and uh, so, without uh, w- without further ado, I simply had to raise my hand and say to the professor, "Did this person also believe that communists can lift four times their own weight?" <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, it's Russians. Have you seen their grandmas? <laughs> In Soviet Russia, our exoskeleton is on the outside. <sighs> It, I mean, I'm not a fan of communism. I'm not a fan of communism, but in, in its defense, I, I I don't think it causes you to have super strength. Uh, or, but in any case, uh, with um, with I I think it's Earth versus the Spider. They had a they had an opening montage uh, talking about uh, America's. Wonderful defense system. Are you referring to the remake or the original? With the original? Because in the original, it just... Unless it's been a while since I remember it. All I remember is that opening with the web and then the guy getting killed. There's, uh... It, it might be... I might be thinking of a different film, but um, I do know this involved giant spiders invading with laser blasts. And uh, the, um, the 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 opening to this film uh, had uh, it had a somewhat of a an expose piece for going for like the first five minutes talking about uh, how great America's defense system is uh, via communications. We have all these uh, we have uh, telephones. And people stationed up north in case something happens that we need to know about, yada yada yada. And it, it's all setting the pace for the, it's all setting the tone for the film because all this defense stuff is going to be needed to warn people about the uh, about the giant spiders. But it was also, it also had another point to it. Uh, they. Uh, with the Cold War going on, they put all that in about our defense system to help reassure the American people that we're in in good hands. And not it, it's kind of a loose connection, but um, so, to sum it up, uh, they've had they've had points since the beginning, and like I say, that can either make or break your film. Like, because the thing is, is that one of your, one of the biggest goals with these giant monster movies, at least nowadays, is to see the giant monster going on a rampage. The thing is, is that if you're, if you want to really try to make a goal, like, a, a, like, if you want to tell a goal, with, giant monsters aren't really the big thing. It depends on, it depends on how they sold it back then, where they... It, it, it depends. I, I guess this is really the case of how the marketing was uh, back when um, something like the Earth versus the Spiders was released. If they want to try to advertise it as if, as like all the Earth, like giant spiders are coming after Earth, then the message will not really be clear because people are not going to come in to listen to the message. They just want to see the spiders coming in. But if you want to make, but if you're going to advertise your movie about how. Um, how our defense is how not ours not mine but like the u.s <laughs> defense system mm. is actually really it's like oh it's the best ever don't worry you're in safe hands like then people will go see that so it definitely is the marketing and how you interpret that but i will say this with some with a title like earth versus the spiders I think the first one would be something that people would go because it's the earth versus the spiders and in a movie about the American, like, 
like about like the safety of like the like the American like weaponry, like their security system and all that stuff. It's not necessarily the Earth. It's just one section of the Earth. I might be. Yeah, but we it. like to think of uh, America as sort of being important in you. Know, America. America. Yeah. America. America. Yeah, the Canadian defense system is just a boot. <laughs> um, Boy, man. Let me. I. I, I would like to. Uh, you went there. Throw my hat in the giant spider ring here. Oh, yay. <laughs> I was waiting for you guys to say your piece, but I... Big-ass spider, big-ass spider, big-ass spider. No. Oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a spider film of the 70s. <clears throat> the, oh, that one. The Giant Spider Invasion. The funny thing about that film, it's filmed locally where I am mm. at, in Wisconsin. <laughs> So it's set in Wisconsin, and the effects for the spiders were f- crazy. Me, I mean, the giant spider was constructed by covering a Volkswagen automobile with artificial black fur, and then with the fake legs operated with inside by seven members of the crew. In the back of the car, there was um, is the front of the car with the headlights, red headlights being the eyes. And, mm. and then, then there was other giant spiders that were actually costumes on dogs. So, <laughs> I mean, you get I gotta love those special. Effects. Is it like is it like the it's like is it like big greyhounds or is yeah, it just yeah, like big, little? Yeah, no, big dogs, big. It's dogs. not like little Yorkshire terriers. No, it's got... <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't that wouldn't it's, is it like giant it's spider. Like... Is it like the whipping in Alien Three? <laughs> yes. It's, a, it's like you just see a little pug. And it's like with yes. eight legs coming out of it. Yeah, see, if it was a if it was a pug, he would be a done deal if he came in my house. <laughs> I would I would pick up the the nearest item and just squash it. <laughs> But yeah, um, there. I got easy access to a weapon right here. Oh, he's got a board with a nail in it. Oh god. Yeah, but the, yeah, the giant spider invasion is actually a personal favorite. My besides the point of being set in Wisconsin, but it's just like it's a very cult classic movie, and it's been featured in Mystery Science Theater too. Damn so right. Damn got right. some exposure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. I'm going to do you guys the favor and show you the quote-unquote images of this film. Oh, uh, like what? The spiders? Pretty much? Yeah. 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 Oh, man. That, yeah. That, because I will admit, that does sound interesting how they made the spider. Yes, because it is. It's amazing. <laughs> I swear to God, the film is just... Um, I suppose the casting of the film actually has like these uh, faded stars of television... So, like, um... And at- here's one of the wireframes right here. There's a story behind this. Ooh. Why do I feel the... Why do I feel the need to put on my Mardi Gras hat? Yeah, this does look like a really awesome parade float. Exactly, right? But there's some sad news to go with it. Oh, what? Mike, do you know about this? Uh, remind me. Okay. I just sent a photo of the, um, the frame used for the giant spiders, and this is true. The, one of the last crew members or director or somebody had one of these things as, you know, a little personal memento and it was out there on the lawn, and someone had the douchey blue balls to actually steal it and sell it as scrap metal. Oh, that's Eesh. right. Oh, I remember this that. Happened, this was last year, by the way. Yes, I saw oh. that. Yep, yep. I remember seeing it on the news. Oh my god, yeah. Oh, you gotta watch out for those douchey blue balls, man. Yes. I, mean, mm-hmm. I mean, there are some major douchebags in Wisconsin, so. 
Yeah. It was stolen. Mm. It was never seen again. And the last they heard about it, someone was just selling it for scrap metal. Yeah, they're just like, I mean, I live on a farm full of scrap metal, so it could have been, like, me, maybe, I mean. <laughs> Although, if, if it is, if it is a decent, if it does have a decent following, we have the technology. <laughs> we could rebuild it. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> nice! Nice. If they can we shall rebuild it with digital wireframes. Yeah. Um, if they can do it with the Ecto one, we can do it with this one. We now have three D printing. We can make like a car spider thing. Uh, car, spider. car spider. Car <laughs> spider. It's like this big, big spider. Seriously, why is this not enough Godforsaken Parade? Why hasn't Disney thought of this? <laughs> That'd be great. The Electric Parade. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> the only like problem a... we need a disney movie that has a giant spider yes we, we sort of do but they're not giant spiders hmm? arachnophobia hey. oh yeah that's a subsidiary company yeah, yeah. that made that touchstone uh, oh, oh. oh but that's not giant i know that's why i brought it up they're pretty big. We can have spiders, John. though. There's the general spider. <laughs> There's John Goodman. <laughs> Let's rock and roll. <laughs> He's a badass in there, so why not? Yeah. Um, that's it. Badass Sully. That right there. Badass Sully, right there. <laughs> <laughs> we give Sully a shotgun. Let's go kick some ass. Uh, Sally, Sally, do you think I should be a be the member of the Target Plastics team here? <laughs> Wait, uh, I'm, I'm sure this. Uh, I'm sure That's this. Uh, the right? shield's made out of metal, right? Right. <laughs> Sally, have you seen my new car? What's the car? What the hell is that spider doing back there? <laughs> <laughs> choop, choop. <Yeah. laughs> Mike's new car choop. God! <laughs> what did you spill? Did you spill your Spider Man cup all over? Oh my god, Mike, you, Mike, you laugh like you're doing the goofy holler. That's the James, not me! That's James! Oh! Oh, my James! You're doing the goofy holler! God, all over me! Oh, um, man! Get a fly sweater, Mike! Get a fly sweater! God. <laughs> now I gotta, now I gotta, now I gotta watch. God, curse you, Spider Man! Kill <laughs> it, it with fire! Flop, <laughs> flop, <laughs> If it helps, Mike, I'll, I'll send a, a, a God's little cup in the future, or maybe. <laughs> I want to make you feel better. Uh, <laughs> this is why. This is why I think the new Spider-Man is bad. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The uh, first one was terrible. The second one's getting mixed reactions. But anyway, back to giant monsters. Um, okay. <sighs> so let's hear about. Um, hmm, hmm. We talked about giant insects. We talked about giant women. We talked, we talked about, about Harryhausen. Harryhausen. Um, <laughs> so what's next? Um, about giant lizards? Repti Gamera. Ga Gamera, yes. Gamera! Gamera! <laughs> um, yeah, Gamera. There's, there's a bunch of giant lizards. It's, it's actually weird how it's the most common creature to be giant. Well, the but thing is, is that 
Mm-hmm. The thing is, is that ever since uh, Godzilla, it be it was pretty much a phenomenon. So a lot of people do want to try to capture that that thing. Plus mm-hmm. the fact that plus another another factor com- that comes into play, dinosaurs. They're pretty much mm-hmm. giant lizards. So mm-hmm. the idea of having like a dinosaur coming back here would seem frightening. So of course you're going to see a lot of movies where a giant lizard comes into attack. I've already mentioned the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, but of course there are other examples, including like Gamera and stuff like that. So uh, I, I'm not, I've, my mind's a little bit empty on Gamera. It's been a while since I've seen that Cinemassacre Monster Madness video, so... <laughs> yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a big Gamera uh, specialist myself. However, where uh, in. that's where oh, Morgan boy. comes in. That's why we have Morgan. <laughs> uh, nice. What is that? Uh, oh, it's Theater. Mystery Science it's Theater. Theater camera. The Steel Bucks edition. <laughs> Pretty. So I think I'll give you the lowdown on you guys, so you don't do your camera. Yes, do tell us the point of Gamera. Yes, yes. So, you got Gamera number one, which I can't believe I'm showing this because Crow and Tom Servo on the covers here. <laughs> it's basically just your typical um, Godzilla knockoff, per se, with a giant turtle waking from the ice. Never explained why there's a giant turtle out in the Arctic. It just appears. It can breathe fire, and best of all, <laughs> it can fly. In some weird way, it is powered by its own fire. In this case, yes, Gamera flies by farts. Yes. Awesome. You can argue Godzilla can also fly, but... <laughs> the weirdest the weirdest thing is, um, with, this, with this one, it goes beyond the realm of being Godzilla knockoff, but it does some new things. Like, for example, there's a kid he saves, I guess, on accident, and supposedly the kids are like, No, Gamera's friendly because he saved me! How can he be tearing up stuff when he saved me? And then he's launched into space and never seen again until his next movie, Gamera vs. Baron. Rugon, where he goes up against a lizard that is supposed to be, I guess, a parody or a knockoff of Angiris, where apparently um, shoots ice or something, and it, it's been a while since I've seen this one, to be honest, so I really don't have much to say about it. It's mm-hmm. um, barely memorable. And you have Gamma vs. Gauss, which I guess is their take on Rodan. Um, again, it's one I barely remember. To be honest, isn't Gauss like it will? I'm sure you'll be. No, nah, never mind. Like you'll. I'm sure you'll. You'll get onto it later on, because there's something familiar about Gauss that I know Maybe about. We should zoom in here. Yep. Yep. That, okay. Yeah. That's definitely. That's what, who I'm thinking of. I'm sure you'll go it's back to Gauss bed. later. And now you'll. And we come to the the next one. Which... Let's just say you'll see him again. Now, of course, to be honest, Mystery Science Year 2000 didn't do all the Gamera movies, and I'll explain why okay. afterwards. They skipped one of them, and I can't remember the name of it, but if I go straight to Wikipedia and talk at the same time, the problem with the Gamera movies is that they were very, very, very redundant. They would have giant turtle, giant monster... And the same cliches, kids getting in trouble, Gamer going in to try and save them, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine it's pretty repetitive. And the only time it was actually even interesting was when they actually were going against the monster. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Right after Gamer versus Gauss, they had Gamer versus Virus, where he goes up against a weird squid like creature, but I have no say on that one. Because instead, Mystery Science Theater 3000 did this one, which is currently my favorite of the Gamera series. Guar- Guaron. Guaron. Oh, it's the blade shark that shoots rainbows. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. 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 <laughs> Taste the rainbow, motherfucker. No, no, that's Guaron. No, no, that, that's Barugon. This one shoots Samurai Stars from its head. Oh. oh. 
Really? I, oh, wait. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, Matt's getting his monsters confused. <laughs> so, this is my favorite one because... Still. This is my favorite one. Sorry, this is my favorite one out of the bunch because it's the most bonkers of the batch. Isn't it I also just... the bloodiest? No, no, you're thinking of Gammon versus um, Jiger with a giant uh, Triceratops creature. Giron has kids getting kidnapped by aliens. Oh, sorry, God. maybe I should, maybe I should use the actual... There we go. They... Oh, yeah, the alien kidnapped... girls. Yeah, the alien girls. And what they plan to do is they plan to eat the kids' brains. Oh, God. And they have gear on this giant Jinsu knife blade of a monster... <laughs> Who just legitimately starts hacking, you know, things to bits and stuff like that. There's a scene where he goes up against a gallows like creature painted in silver, and in one of the most That's what I was about to to say. Yes! Yes, he slices them in half. They actually took the the gallows monster and just spray painted them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, do you want yours thickly cut? Um And of course Gamer comes in and the fight scenes are just completely batty. There's a scene where he gets tossed onto like one of those poles and he holds onto it and you see him going around yes. and around and around like an old big thing and he gets shot with all these stars and he starts dancing for no reason, like the go go or something. And then there's the scene <laughs> where he kills Giron in the spaceship containing the two aliens by chucking the blade and it explodes. <laughs> Nice. You know, for some reason, when you mentioned the pole thing, the only thing I could think of is this thing has actually predated uh, Jurassic Park 2. <laughs> Oddly enough, it's like you just have you just see Gamera. <gasps> but no, um, it's my favorite of the bunch because this is the one I easily remember the most because so many crazy things happen there's like a really bizarre scene where they're hypnotizing the kids and they try to get inside their heads and know what they want and for some weird reason there's a bit where they look inside their heads and all they think about is donuts the kids yeah the kids so they actually (laughs) so they actually feed them donuts and there's like some sleeping pill placed into them they start eating like oh this is getting sleepy and they actually shave their heads in preparation for eating the brains and well obviously it doesn't happen because it's a kid's film (laughs) donut oh god Mm, donuts Donuts. i think there's a really great riff in um the ms t3k version we see them eating the donuts and Gamera's flying and Crow goes, I told them not to eat the donuts, but no, they ate the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Something like that. But no, it's my favorite out of the bunch. I highly recommend it. Unrift or Rift. It's either fun, either way. And there's Gamera versus Jiger, which Mike brought up, which is the most goriest of the bunch. Like, legitimately, it's something about a stone getting captured, and this monster awakens, and it's like this huge triceratops, and it shoots, like, these weird quill-like spikes into Gamera, and you actually see, like, green blood coming out of them and stuff, and there's even a scene where they literally, I kid you not, they go inside Gamera and find that there are mini baby Jigers in there. And the only way to kill it off is, like, some radio wave or something like that. What? It gets better. In mm. the end, Gamera is going up against Jiger, and because of the hypnosis radio waves that affect him, there's only one thing he can do, and that's block out the signal. What does he do? He pulls a bullwinkle and shoves two telephone poles into his ears. Like. <laughs> God, really? He just legitimately... Oh ooh, ah, silence. Silence is golden. <laughs> Eat fire, motherfucker! <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's the thing about the Gamera films, is that, mm. in a way, like, it's, it's obvious in plain sight that it's a Godzilla ripoff, mm. but one of the things that 
uh, Gamera does is that it goes beyond over the top with the concepts. It would go things. It would do things that Godzilla would be. I don't know how embarrassed go to do. Into, <laughs> yeah, because like Godzilla would go into more of a science fiction factor with its stuff, but like Gamera. It just does whatever it wants. It can have mm. monsters that shoots out rainbows. Like they could have thing. They're gonna have things that would be normally you, you would find in like Power Rangers or something like that. Like Gamera, like at least they have the freedom to do that. And that's where Gamera versus Zigra came in. Zigra, or what I like to call Jaws Six. Oh gosh! <laughs> it's a silver. If you can see this, it's a silver swordfish from outer space, and it's in a spaceship where this giant dome-like thing is covered in skittles. Oh, like skittles? Yes, and apparently Zygra is half ship, half monster, and half planet. What? And he's trying to control all the people because of the fishing and the pollution and stuff like that. And you can imagine Gamera coming in. There's like a fight scene underwater that's badly shot because it's in the dark, but you can still make things out. There's a scene where he uses a bone and plays the Gamera theme on him like a xylophone, but very slowly. At this point, it's a very, very tiring entry. And it really, it, it, crazy as it sounds, it feels very limited compared to the others, which were, as you said before, really over the top, really overblowing. Here, it's an obvious rehash. Aliens go to Earth. Aliens try to invade Earth. Gamera blasts in, and it's Gamera fun time. Gamera mm -hmm. saves kids. Kids get into Alien Dome. Kids try to evade Alien. Alien somehow gets averted. Giant monster that was associated with Alien kids tries to take over donuts. Earth. Yes, kids eat <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame because this was the last movie that um, the studio, I think they're called Dai D-A-I-E-I Dai makes the very best Um, they went bankrupt after this one so you know, it's all about how far you can actually um, take the series and technically I just found found that um they did make a uh, Gamera Next Generation. Yes, yes, I didn't see those, unfortunately. Uh, but just for the bulk of it, if you want to see good old style um, monster movies getting mocked, this is your best bet. And this is where I should probably bring up the idea of why certain monster films don't really get that good. Um... Well, maybe I should explain this. You see. The Japanese take their monster movies very seriously. Very, very seriously. Even if they're seriously aimed toward kids. Mm -hmm. So, you can imagine how it is over here. It's like, oh, guy in a rubber suit. Ha, ha, ha. Over there, it's like, no. They're taking monsters and putting them in a very poetic kind of nature. Like, using them as a metaphor for the force of nature, force of wind, anything like that. Um... A good example off the top of my head would probably have to be Polisari, which I've heard about and seen clips of, which is about this mini monster that gets bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> and feeds on metal resources, all sorts of stuff, and becomes this monster that's legitimately eating Mother Nature and is supposedly, well, you, know, you know what I mean, just sort of like resources and stuff and eating and mm -hmm. eating and eating. And it's supposed to be this commentary from what I heard about the greed of man that continuously grows. Over here, we look at it and go, Ha ha ha! Giant monster that eats metal! So funny! And that's the thing. When Mystery Science Year 3000 picked up the Gamera movies for syndication when they were moving over to Comedy Central, long story, won't get into it, because it's too hard to you know go into the roots. But long story short, they started on an... In independent Minneapolis channel and then they moved to Comedy Channel which turned into Comedy Central got owned by HBO in the third season they said 
hey, you know what? We did some really interesting episodes over in the independent Minneapolis station. Let's do them. And the first ones they brought over were Gamera because mm-hmm. they did them in the um, mm. in the independent station. And you can see those online too, thankfully, thanks to um, fan copies. But they're crude as hell. So when they did the Gamera films, they pretty much schmocked the heck out of it, even though... It was um, a redundant series because they kept making the same jokes, the same things, pulling out the same cliches. And rumor has it, and this is not true, this is something fans caught on, because a good majority of the films were owned by one syndicator, because, you know, certain Japanese dub movies are owned Mm -hmm. by a syndicator in America, this, these movies were from the doing of one Sandy Frank. And yes, this is the man's name, Sandy Frank. Sandy um, Frank, Sandy, Sandy Frank, Frank, he's the source, the source of all of our pain. pain. <laughs> he kept on getting mocked on MST3K and all this sort of stuff. And the, the story, or the rumor goes, is that he caught wind of this and he was upset. So when it came to re-license the films, he flat out refused because he felt he was being insulted too much. And thus a good chunk of season three was missing even on DVD to this day. But truth be told, the main reason why he didn't even reinstall rights is because of a popular thing that was going on with Mystery Science Year 3000 at the time. You see, why do movies like Man of Stands of Fate get popularity? Why do movies like Future War get popularity? Or Tormented, or The Beatniks? Because they were seen here. And they were the only resource of time to see movies here. And they were terrible to begin with. Oh, that too. They got their recognition through television. There barely was any internet. And you had a TV show that was mocking bad movies. And that's how people knew about them. You know, pod people and uh, the attack of the eye creatures. They were all seen here. And that's where they got their huge cult status. Because of this one show. So as you can imagine, ooh. The more people know about these things, the more popular they are. Let's increase the syndication rights. We have profits, profits, profits. So you can imagine it was pretty difficult getting the Gamma movies for such a small shoestring budget. And they had to let them go. But thankfully, um, over time in DVD, things were let up a little with the Shout Factory when they got the rights to do Gamma. And I'm really glad to see them actually pour their hearts out to get this set together. So... If you want a good monster fun, I highly recommend this set. Mm. So there's my product plug on camera. This episode is sponsored by Mystery Science Theater and Shout Factory. And camera. That's too distant future. Well, it's nice to hear that there is a happy ending to that. Oh, yeah. They actually got released on DVD and in volume. It was either 22 or 23. They actually had Sandy Frank do an interview, believe it or not. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Boy, okay, uh, little sidetrack with Mr. Science here, but uh, I want to get back to the core of giant lizards in general. Well, 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 well the, the show's oh, important, yeah. too, because they, they showcased giant monster movies there, too. Mm-hmm, why, it's one terrible. that we uh, actually ended up watching, me and Morgan, <laughs> and, in uh, preparation for this. And that would be... Oh, wait, 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 here's an update, here's an update, here's an update. Okay. In regards to the Sandy Frank mocking... He said, and I quote in a 2012 interview, he thought the show was cute, okay, and a laugh, and his films on the show were nothing he took seriously. Ah. Just that I would clarify that. Okay, okay. Good, 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 good. Moving on, moving right. on, moving on. So, well, that would be what? What movie did you guys watch? We watched Gorgo. Gorg? Gorg? Oh. Gorgo. Gorgo. <sighs> yes. The with Nate, with Nate the mm, clown. With <laughs> yep. Uh, don't. Oh, by the way, don't worry. From the looks of it, we're still in the giant lizards. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes, Gorgo, which is apparently one of Leonard Maltin's favorite giant monster movies. Leonard Maltin, and... seriously? Yep. Yes. And I was actually quite surprised. 
Uh, we watched this episode together. Leonard Maltin comes on the show, Mystery Science Theater, and and uh, plays a version of himself that delights in the prospect of terrorizing the gang with this favorite movie of his. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. That, that actually sounds really awesome for Leonard. Mm. It, which goes to show, you know, just just what kind of pull the uh, MST3K gang had. And um, uh, as for the film, as for the film itself, uh, it um, uh, it goes back to uh, it goes back to the the point that I was trying to make before about um, monster about movies. whether yes about monster movies uh, make or break either have a heart or a point or have uh, have good craft. I don't remember the heart or the point. And by I, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna argue that by today's standards they don't have very good craft. However, Morgan has another take on that. I think in basic general, it's just a. British version of the Godzilla meets King Kong sort of story with some minor alterations. And being someone who likes um, cheesy monster movies, what they are, and again, being a fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000, I found it enjoyable in the vein of its own special effects, in the vein of its own cheesiness. And yeah, there is a human element, but to be fair... They did some effort. They actually did some effort for it. Half of the time, it's not a guy in a suit. There's actually one scene where they capture Gorgo. Spoiler alert, it's really the kid. Um, yes, the mother is taller. It's like 200 feet tall or something like that. The kid's only like 60 feet tall. Um, the when they when they capture the kid, they're putting him through the streets. They have him on this giant cart with a drape that says Gorgo on it. That's a giant model. That's not an actual you know miniature scale or anything. They actually built that motherfucker. It's a giant. They actually built a giant monster, just like with the '76 King Kong, where they had a giant Kong model for the big reveal sequence, and. I was surprised. I later watched the documentary Ninth Wonder of the World, which is you know also on this DVD, by the way. Um, and I was just impressed to see how much effort they put into this movie, even though it was like half and half. It had this enjoyable, cheesy vibe, and it sort of made me think back to how, again, going back to Gamera, they just did it for fun, they just did it for what it was. Um, yes, Gorgo is not... Godzilla or King Kong, but at the very least, it had some decent destruction, it had some decent special effects. I think the point was they were just trying to make a monster movie with like a very Irish sort of mythos, which worked to its advantage. True, there is no emotion to it, but eh, there's some fun to it. And some see-through debris falling. (laughs) With Nate the Clown. (laughs) Uh, uh, I will push that joke until it gets mentioned. But for those who have seen the actual episode, you got to know what I'm talking about. You get bonus points if you know that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You get a you get a comment cookie. With Nate the Clown. <laughs> um, Rate, comment, and subscribe if you know Nate the Clown. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm not even going to so, bring that joke. Just, I, I say go see the episode. It, it's great. But just seeing it as a movie as a whole, it's, eh, you know, it has some charm. I'm the kind of guy that likes cheesy things like the Super Mario Brothers movie and another film we'll probably talk about later. But um, I thought Gorgo was okay. It wasn't, like, terrible in terms of anything painful or bad like Manos, The Hands of Fate, or Monsters of Go-Go. 
it just seems like it would play itself very safe and had nice special effects. That's why it gets a pass for me. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, it didn't do anything offensive. No, it no, it didn't. No, I'm no. I'm not saying it did. I was just I I was just I it, it with uh with the preacher design it, it just felt generic and I I I understand I understand that um uh they did they did the best they could for its time, but I, I just I just didn't think it had aged well and for corn for corniness I've I've seen better like our <laughs> next example mm-hmm. that I have. Later TV's Frank later. Um yes. Like I said, uh Morgan and I were doing our research the night following uh Gorgo, which I didn't like so much and he liked. Um we watched a movie where he didn't like so much and I liked. I am talking about uh, Reptilicus. The Reptilicus. Reptilicus. The first and last Danish monster movie. With Danish Ernest P. Worrell. Mm-hmm. No, uh, actually it was... Uh, no, no. It was oh. Dopo, the fifth Marx brother. Oh, yeah, yeah, Dopo. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that snake thing. Yes. Oh, yeah. And contrary to popular rumors, he does fly, just on the American version. Yes, we saw the last footage. It's really, really, really bad. If I can demonstrate here, they just have a puppet with wings on the back flying around in the dark. It's so obviously on a string. It's like, it's this is the equivalency of it. It's like, <laughs> it's just, ugh, good God. I can just imagine kids running on the set going, yay, paper airplane. <laughs> A paper airplane is more convincing that you could fly than Reptilicus. Yeah. How sad is that? <laughs> but, but well, no. here's... Uh, go on. No, no, you you go on. This is your movie. Okay. I, I already mm-hmm. poured my heart out over Gorgo. Okay, Reptilicus, uh, it, it has, it has a, a, a pretty, a fairly... Uh, original monster, I should say. Um, the uh, the the whole plot is uh, miners dig up this uh, dig up this tail that uh, that's been frozen for god how god knows how many years, and uh, freeze it for and kept it keep it frozen so that um, they can study it. However, thanks to uh, thanks to uh, one nutty doctor uh, who forget who leaves the door open to the freezer, as like it were, you do. like you do, uh, the tail thaws out, and uh, we have another. We have a terrific discovery. This tail is regenerating itself. It is growing cell by cell to create a formidable monster. And so one night during a terrific thunderstorm, the the electricity in the atmosphere gives the growing or the regrowing of this monster in the laboratory a double dose of get me out of this tail. And next thing you know, we have our our giant lizard monster. Now the reason why I like why I like this one is because mainly the design. The design that I it um, it 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 feels a little bit more like a, a Harryhausen monster, but you can still tell it's a puppet with uh, uh, walking around in models. Uh, as per their craft. And here's where I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. You see, this film 
doesn't have much of a not much of a point nor much of a heart. Or but the craft much. is but the but craft it does is, have a lot of string. Mm, no, it has a lot of slime. Ew. You see the the craft is so particularly bad it makes it enjoyable to watch. <sighs> and there is a reason for it. You see, one of the things that the creators of the movie should have thought of to begin with is something that AIG, as Morgan so wonderfully discovered for us during the time we are watching the film, thought up and said this would make a better monster. Instead of a giant lizard that just sort of lumbers around and then crashes into things and scares people, uh, they decided when bringing this movie to America uh, that it should shoot green acid slime out of its mouth. And so what we have is compo cheaply composited green slime effects. And it is brilliant to a degree because when they use them, you can de you can definitely tell that they didn't know what they were what they were doing. You also forgot the cheaply compositive eating civilian. Oh, I was going to get to that. Yes, uh, they decided to. Yes, uh, there's one scene in the film in which uh, Reptilicus knocks down a farmhouse and I guess sort of looks at two people inside. Or, no, it's a it's a family of people. Yeah. Um, the uh, a a per a perfect or a, a good movie would have uh, just sort of left you with that, and uh, just said it just gave you the impression that Reptilicus is about to do something to this family. Uh, and cut away to the next thing. This film did not do that. It, uh, or the, at least the American cut did not do it. It uh, cheaply composited photographs or frames of the family members into the mouth of Reptilicus. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like in some awkward situation like this. Uh, 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 yeah. Really, really goofy stream. Like, it's like they're just doing a dog paddle on his tongue. <laughs> oh god! It is a it is a sight so bad. It is glorious to behold. But back to the green goo. Um. <laughs> The way the way that this is executed, uh, you you uh, you see the green goo fall fly out of the monster's mouth. Never do you see it land. Not once do you see it land, except for on the lens. Seriously, when it shoots out, it covers the whole frame. It's like it comes out, and and it cuts to it'll it'll cut to the people running away from the monster. And then you'll just see the slime rain down in the gut. It is so jarring that that the only way the only way to possibly describe it is as a last minute effort to try and save the film. Um, but when you have when you have a monster that shoots green acid slime, you show the bodies afterward if you're going to show it. If you're going to show it shooting the slime, am I right? Yeah, like you would see like the effect of what would like what would happen, like if you, when a monster does something, like you see the destruction it would cause. You can't just see the thing. Actually, while you were talking, I just like I just watched a video. Just I muted to listen to you, but I mute, I I saw um, James Rolfe's top ten uh, mo giant monsters, and one of them was actually Reptilicus. And I saw, like, it actually shows, like, when he does the slime, and it's like, it looks so fake. Like, it, like, it doesn't really remind me of a monster attacking. This looks like 
like Reptilicus is going to shoot out the slime and then I'm expecting to come out like the slime to go on screen and said, Nick will be right back. <laughs> and now back to the real Ghostbusters. Yes. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. But see that, that it's a, it is a skill that the, the filmmaker should have thought of to begin with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Morgan, your reaction to the film. I was with this movie when they had the human characters and the concept. So they find like some red blood or something and they find that they were drilling the remains of a creature. Okay, fine. They put it on ice. Okay, fine. That was a standard for like every 50s or 60s monster. They discover it and they melt it. Hell, Doctor Who used that a lot. The, the Ice Warriors, Power of the Daleks, um, the Robotic Yetis, the Cold War episode, which they did recently. By golly, I, he's right, and so did Encino Man. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, James! <laughs> <laughs> He did not. He did not just bring that up. <laughs> oh no, you get it. Oh, James, what did okay. you do? Okay, okay. Anyways, I was with it for a good chunk of the time, and then we get to the monster. <laughs> it makes the giant claw look like a muppet. Because it's very... what, not a muppet now. <laughs> No, here, here's the thing. Reptilicus is just a rod puppet being dragged or held up, and it's so damn obvious. And okay, I give it props for you know doing something at least different, but I didn't feel anything with this monster. I don't know why, either because of the cheap puppeteering or the fact it came from an era where everybody was jumping on the bandwagon with giant monsters and you sort of expected, you know, something like Godzilla or something along the lines of Ray Harryhausen or something like Howard um, Hughes Hawks, whatever his name was, who did the, the who produced the thing for the world. Howard Hawks. Yeah, thank you. And maybe it was because of how the American edit retooled it, but... I just really felt nothing after that. It's like, okay, the buildup is there, the setup is there, but then we get the actual monster attacking, and I just got nothing. The 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 the, the slime is so cheaply compositive. I'm just sitting there going, maybe I should see the original cut because to me this feels like Miramax's Thief and the Cobbler here. They just took the original Danish cut, redubbed it, and then just added extra effects to be like, okay, how can we better this? I know. How about Acid Slime? I know. How about we dub this, redub that so it feels more incoherent and all that sort of stuff? <laughs> to me... Let's make the giant monster be voiced by Jonathan Winters. <laughs> yes. Now that would be more interesting. That would be more interesting. Oh, let's see what's in this nice spam container right here. Oh, damn, it's full of oats. Well, maybe this house will do me quite well. Ooh, a Thanksgiving dinner. Don't mind if I have a leg. running <laughs> <laughs> away. Might as well shoot up my green slime. Oh, 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 God. Oh, oh so much heartburn. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. I almost forgot the crowning achievement of the effects team. The one shot, the one acid shot in the film in which Reptilicus is at this side of the screen and the slime comes shooting out of this side of the screen. <laughs> you know... Out of thin air! <laughs> I would have been fine... <laughs> I would have been fine with this film if it was like made by Hammer Horror... Or maybe if it was done in the vein of, like, Valley of the Giants or, you know, maybe or Dr. Cyclops. Like, or if it's, like, a Roger Corman flick. Or yeah, something or something like, like, something, something like that, because that makes sense. To me, this felt like a cash kin, a cash cow, but a very, very cheap cash cow. And that's where I kind of had my limits. It's like, okay, I'm with you to the halfway. 
these are the basic things that are in every single standard monster movie. And even as a kid, I would actually, you know, see redundancy within these things. You know, okay, Godzilla movies, which we'll probably get to later. Yeah, they're redundant as well. But at the very least, they do something different. They do something creative with each movie so the formula doesn't get tiring. Robo Godzilla, um, a three-headed dragon that shoots lasers and all sorts of things. When I was sitting there watching Reptilicus, I kept saying to myself, okay, these are things I've seen in every standard 50s, 60s science fiction horror movie. What is there to give? A bad puppet with bad compositing. I'm done. Yeah, that's pretty much, I think uh, Reptilicus sounds like pretty much one of the examples that just because the way you're doing it is different than all the other films doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good idea. I mean, there's I mean, a reason even... why, like, there's a reason why nobody, like, none of the big shots are doing it. And that's I mean, pretty much why. Even the giant claw at the very least, was doing something different. They were, at the very least, taking the giant monster idea, and ridiculous as it was, they did something. Yes, it, it, it was a hilarious, unintentionally hilarious idea, but come on, it's a radioactive bird that's big as a battleship that flies around in a spiral. And somehow, somehow, that is discovered by three different dots. It's like, wait a minute, those three dots... I see a pattern. <laughs> exactly. There's something interesting right there. I mean, it's dumb, but it's an interesting dumb. It's like, how do you associate that? You could argue that the bird itself is legitimately trying to make some sort of weird, bizarre, radiational territory kind of thing. But Reptilicus, it's just a lizard. It's, it's just a, a, a long snake lizard. And that's it. Mm-hmm. So that's why I felt cheated at the end. Because it's like, okay, I know I'm expecting some giant reptilian monster, but there's really nothing else I can say of it. It just felt like a Danish version of Godzilla meets the thing. Uh, it it came from beneath the sea where they had the same standard characters, the, the scientists and stuff, studying the radiational effects on an octopus. That's how they find out the octopus gets big and all that sort of stuff. It just felt like the standard cliches of every single monster movie, and they weren't doing anything different with it. Mm-hmm. I will remake it one day, and I will give the scientist a point. Quiet, you. <laughs> um, speaking, of, speaking of films like that, uh, where, you, where there's two um, animals spliced together, sort of like a snake and lizard, mm-hmm. there's other films that kind of spliced other animals together and made a monster movies. Um, I watched one for homework for this episode... And it was a Roger Corman produced film mm-hmm. from 2004, and it was Dino Croc. Okay. I thought you were going to mention Carnosaur. I have not okay, seen now, that one. Neither have I. Neither have I. Sounds like now the same you're. Thing. <laughs> but Gene says uh, I liked it. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, if Gene Siskel the show might like it too. <laughs> Um, now I, now you're diving into a different form of territory. Shit that I can't understand why it even exists. But, yes, um, exactly. Um, <laughs> and D- Dino Croc is an interesting breed because um, I don't know why laboratories are doing this, but apparently this, um, what is it called, it Genotech, they took this uh, prehistoric dinosaur that's related to the crocodile. They took the DNA of that and spliced it with a modern crocodile. And they test, they just watch them, you know, test it, you know, do some research on it. The beginning of the film, you know, there's two baby crocodiles. And they're just, one of them's like, <coughs> and it kills the other one. Dead. And the assistant goes, walks in, and it's like, what's going on here? Oh my god. And then he, she gets killed. All right, now, now the thing's loose. And it's a little baby thing. And eventually, throughout the whole film, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Train more <laughs> truffier trees than this needs. <laughs> oh, God. And um, 
it's it's a dino croc so he's out in the lake you know terrorizing and he's got this cool vision like if you see piranha the 2010 remake it's got the piranha vision kind of thing going with the and um you don't see the dino croc like full size you just see the vision and you see him attacking and it's pretty cool and um the film one of the side characters is played by um the kid who was in lizzie mcguire the brat brother i can't remember his name like jake uh, thomas yeah. so he's in it and he's looking for his uh, dog lucky who is a three-legged three-legged dog and um the dog meets up with dino croc and dog runs away and then um some side story where there's a the romantic lead and the brother of Jake Thomas, you know, they're trying to get together and they're trying to help to find the dog. And behind the scenes, they're like, oh, we saw Lucky at the preserve. And Jake Thomas is like, oh, I'm going to go over there and find my dog. And so he goes over to find his dog. And, of course, Dino Croc's there. So mm -hmm. he this bratty kid, I didn't like him in Lizzie McGuire, by the way, so it was good to see him in this film. Um, somehow, um, get so attacked. I, I'm leading up to that point. It's, it's actually a really good attack. Um, so he, he's scared shitless cause he sees Dino Craig straight to run away. He goes inside this house and he goes looking under and he sees Dino Craig underneath the, so he's, so Dino Croc goes up, <laughs> decapitates him. Decapitates oh. him. <laughs> It's, Yo, it is awesome because it's a CGI head. It comes flying up, and it comes down like it's like a um, looks like looks like the actor kind of laid there on the side, and they kind of green screen the rest of the body out, and it's like a severed head. <laughs> it's... Actually, that can work. It it worked. It looked like a real head. It did. It looked looked really good, but the CGI head popping up didn't really look that. Good. Oh no. Um, so the subplot of the dog is just completely out of the way because for your viewing pleasure, there's there's no point of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I gotta see that. Ha <laughs> It's like the kid was like, God forsaken stationary. It's like he stayed there. It's like, this is he's got. Exactly. <laughs> like, um, what the fridge was that? So, it it, it kind of goes like in a Jaws territory where the um, animal <laughs> reserve and the sheriff are like, you know, it's coming into the lake. You gotta get the people out of the water. Out of the water. Out of the water. Out of the water. Get out of the water. Yeah. I'm so, sorry. I'm watching this on repeat. <sighs> yeah, same here. Like. <laughs> There's something so fascinating about no, that scene. No, I know. It's the best part of the movie, actually. <laughs> it is, honestly. Um, it, uh, it's like the top of the bottle literally exploding. <laughs> yeah, literally. Exactly. <laughs> shake, 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 shake. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Dino Croc's attacking. They have to try to capture it. But the best part is, hold on. Give me a sec. Crikey, mate! They gotta bring a, a Australian hunter to get the crocodile. You see? <laughs> I'm oh. afraid. And the guy's name is Dick. <laughs> hey, Dick, mm. how you doing? Crikey, mate! I'm gonna get the crocodile. It's not a regular crocodile. You see? <laughs> it's a big dino croc. So we gotta we gotta capture him and put oxys gas so it passes him out and blah 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 blah. This oh no, he's a Steve Irwin. This bloody crocodile's a bloody puff <laughs> Um Paul Hogan, is that you? <laughs> the funny thing is that um, there's a scene where Dino Croc's in the water and the, the, the main characters and Dick, the Australian hunter, um, chases after it. He, Dick goes in the water with the Dino Croc. He's crazy. His Dick goes in the water? <laughs> Yes, Dick goes in the water. Dick goes in the water. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's trying to fight the Dino Croc, and he he comes from his belt. He pulls out 
the knife. And that's the knife. He takes the knife and pokes him in the eye. <laughs> no, no, this is too obvious of a joke. Oh, God. The things we you can say. Is that your knife, or are you just glad to see me? <laughs> um, so... They didn't show the, cro- the Dino Croc yet, so towards the end of the film, he sees Dino Croc coming out of the water, and it's CGI, and it's poorly rendered CGI. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The CGI is bad. Really bad. And, and Dino Croc, mind you, is, like I said, it's half crocodile, half dinosaur. He's got the crocodile body, but he's got his the legs of a dinosaur... And like a Tyrannosaurus Rex arms, <laughs> so he's like he's like. I'm a freak of nature. How long am I supposed to open a beer? <laughs> I'm getting. I've got a big, you. big head and little tiny arms. <laughs> if I hear you. So. No, no. He's trying to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> so, so at first they're trying to trap him and try to uh, pat, like, like trying to kill him out with some, some, uh, what is this? Some kind of gas they can pass him out with and kill him. Well, they do it and they assume he's dead, but he comes back alive and kills like the head of the genotech. Uh, laboratories, and he's on the rampage again, and goes after the main characters again, and the main characters get this blowtorch, he's like and and he's like Um, the point being, they're by the railroad tracks and he tries to lure the dino croc towards the train, all of a sudden you see the train go by (laughs) it's the dino croc He just, he just, he just, you see it disappear. (laughs) And then they assume he's dead and uh uh-oh, and the end of the scene goes, he's, you see him walking by, he's alive. (laughs) And two sequels were produced from this film. Uh, next one was Super, uh, Super Gator, which, there's a little backstory, uh, Roger Corman wanted to do a sequel. So sci-fi was like, no, we're not, do- we're not doing Dino Croc 2. We're not good with sequels. So he renames it Super Gator. I, not, I have not seen that film because I couldn't find it at the time. Um, sounds stupid as hell. I'm not even going to go into it. If you want to look it up, look it up. But the third film was Dino Croc vs. Super Gator. Oh, it was a Red Band trailer. The only thing you can imagine is just a crocodile entering a phone booth. <laughs> By day, he is known as Croc Kent. But then... <laughs> Disguise but, then when danger, but then when danger calls, comes Super Gator. <laughs> Lois! <laughs> Lois! You have the barracuda ready? Good. For the next 40 minutes, I'm going to be busy. Glasses off. The third film. Oh, my God. It is the worst sequel i ever seen. The worst versus movie I've ever seen. I mean, the characters are not interesting. You have the late, great David Carradine in it. Is it uh, Jason X bad? Uh, it's probably worse than that. Mm. It's probably worse because, of course, the CGI is somewhat better, but it looks cheesy as hell compared to the live-action characters. I couldn't get into it. I couldn't even watch it. I just stopped after. I mean, after seeing David David Carradine, I was like, okay, you're doing a good job, but everything else is. And Same. like you can only watch going David Carradine why? Yeah. Exactly. It's like why did you choose that role as the last one? 
One of the last ones. <sighs> is it Dino Shark? Or is it Shark to push? <laughs> or is it Mega Shark versus Crocosaurus? Or is it Dino Croc versus Super Gator? Dino Croc versus Super Gator. It was. You know how sad it is. Have you ever thought how sad it is? By every single film that we've mentioned, are things that exist. Yeah. Not in real life, but actual movies. Yeah, movies. Yes. Um, Mega Python versus Gatoroid. Yeah, there's a lot of versus monster battles. There's um, oh, there was one of them. Let me just check my list here. What a, there was a versus battle. Um, what the fuck was it? It was Piranaconda. <laughs> Piranaconda. Yes, Piranaconda. Yes, that I have not seen it, but I seen like images and trailer footage of it. It's pretty much a piranha spliced with an anaconda. Why I would mean, you do this? I mean, and it's a giant monster, too. It's just, like, it's the weirdest... And it looks weird, too, if you look it up. It's it's a hat. Okay, okay, new plan, new plan, new plan. What the frig we, is... <laughs> we shall combine a leprechaun with the blood of a Komodo dragon. <laughs> oh... It was. We shall cross a, rod, a rubber chicken with a rubber band and see what we come up with. <laughs> the, the movie I was thinking of was Lucky. <laughs> we'll take the essence of Santa Claus and the essence of Frosty the Snowman and make a new holiday character. Yeah, okay, now I see, like, it's piranha. Okay, now I can see exactly what kind of movie it is. It is. Because it's... now I found a picture. It's freaking Piranha Conda. And then we have this fake scientist girl. You know it's fake because it's a hot chick with blonde hair and yep. big boobs. Yep, yeah, it's a, it's a sci-fi like, movie. Oh my god, it's the para. Oh my god, this must be the creature. I must write this in my assignments. <laughs> That's nothing. You should, you, we, should, uh, you should see the poster image they have for the end movie database. Because Michael that... Madsen. Sorry. Yeah, even the poster. It's freaking Piranaconda and an ass. Like, literally... It, it's control. evil ass. <laughs> yes. Ass is good. Evil is good, and ass is good. And if you get like, some evil ass... Woo, because woo. it's like, Piranaconda is like... Even the Piranaconda, he's just looking at it as like... Dead ass. <laughs> dead ass. Look at that ass. Um, so, yeah, sci- sci-fi is known for that, and... I kind of, you know, I DVR it once in a while. It depends on what the movie is. I mean, I'm a sucker for those. I mean, I'm, some might be good, some might be bad. Um, I did some other homework, and you might say, oh, it's not a giant monster. It's a freaking creature feature. It doesn't count. <laughs> Quiet, you. <laughs> so, I watched um, a movie called Alligator. And um, it's from 1980, and uh, you might have heard of this before. Um, it's been an urban legend uh, it's before. Um, alligators in the sewers? Yes. I was just, yeah, alligators in the sewers. So um, this kid, this little girl, gets a pet alligator, and he has it in the cage, and it's like, oh, you got to be a nice little pet. We're going to have some so much fun. And daddy's like, he picks it up. Yeah, we don't need this. We're not getting. No, he's just not gonna have an alligator. Flush it down the toilet. Flush it down the toilet. Flush the alligator down the toilet. Why? A baby alligator. Uh, well, how big is it? It's like a little baby. You know, you pick it up by the tail, pick it up by the back tail, and boop. So pretty much. Oh, by the way, this. Uh... This uh, this film is not to be confused with Crocodile, which is released the same year. Yes, yes, don't get confused by that, yes. Because Alligator is so much better. It is. <laughs> Honestly, it is. Let me let me go on. Um, so there's urban myths that, you know, you flush alligators down the drain, they'll mutation, it'll get boom, big. So that's what happens in the movie. Um, there's been these killings and there's like this alligator got mutated because the sewers in Chicago got uh, some nuclear stuff and they got mixed together and he grew big. Um, nuclear. Nuclear. 
Um, at first, it's like, it's, how do I describe it? It's kind of like the new Godzilla film. It kind of builds up the cro- the alligator. You don't see him at first. You see him through uh, first person uh, first person view, and they see him attacks. But there's this awesome part in the middle of the film. These street kids are playing uh, street ball, and their home plate is a sewer um, lid. And all of a sudden, you hear, <laughs> and this alligator breaks open through the sewer lid in the concrete boom he comes out of nowhere and he's huge he is huge and i mean huge bigger than a normal alligator and and it's not cgi it's not because it's 1980s there was no cgi back then really um it looked like a how do i describe it it wasn't a real alli- it could have been a real alligator but it looked like it was more like a a creature shop alligator in a way like it was a like a costume where it was leather and it was walking like it's somebody that jim henson kind of made but it looks realistic because jim henson didn't make anything realistic exactly <laughs> i didn't want to say it's like oh, it was a cheesy made costume um Wait, 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 wait. Is this the movie where there's a scene where a bunch of kids shove another kid in the pool and the alligator is in the pool and they shove the kid in and the alligator eats the kid? I believe that is the one you're I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And y- what a mean movie it sounds like. <laughs> it is. Yeah, the alligator they just shove him right in, they see some blood. Mom, mom, mom. Um yeah, I mean, and then the alligator rampages through, and they have to figure out how to get rid of the alligator. And it's a really good film. You should actually check it out, actually. Um, but then a sequel is produced. Oh, where do I go with the sequel? Where do I alligator go? Alligator 2, Alligate Harder. I don't know. The Mutation. The Mutation. Uh, so, a little back here. Um, at the end of the film, they spoiled that there was a baby alligator in the sewer. Uh-oh. Sequel bait. So, in Alligator 2 The Mutation, it was a direct-to-DVD film uh, in the mid-90s, I believe. 1991. Early early 90s, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. About, what, like, 11 years after the original? Uh, so, uh, I cannot get into the characters whatsoever. Um, there's this dad who's a workaholic where he, and is the first scene you see, he wakes up and it's his birthday and you hear the mom and child and it, they're on the TV screen. They're like, happy birthday, dad. Happy birthday, husband. And it's like, uh, well, we don't see you as often because you work during the night and we're sleeping or during the day and blah, blah, blah. And so they have to tape their birthday messages and put in the VCR for the dad to wake up to. Ah. It's like uh, Bill Cosby and Ghost Dad at the beginning, you know? <laughs> I, I, I just... I just don't get... I mean, I couldn't get into the characters. The main character couldn't get into. But I was... I, was, I, was, I, I couldn't even... So I, I kind of skipped forward a bit. I kind of like seen what the alligator was doing. So I was just like, okay, they kind of built up that the alligator is there attacking. But the best part is at the end, towards the end, where he's attacking this um, circus state fair and the alligator is cheesy as fuck. Cheesy <laughs> as fuck. Because you see the tail come out of nowhere and wag and it's foam. It's a foam tail. It, it, it's, it's, you can see, you can see it whack people. And then the alligator, you don't see the body. You don't know the power of styrofoam. You, you sort of see the body as it crawls out of the water, but as it, you, you gotta see what it's chasing. Cause it's chasing and you see this in the corner, you see this alligator head and it's like, on like a motorized vehicle and it's like, chasing after people it's got red beady eyes like it's the devil or something 
Oh my god. Oh. And it's got the best ending, too. Spoiler alert. So, the main character grabs a bazooka and shoots the alligator. <laughs> Whoa. And, and he, he explodes into a million pieces. It's so glorious. It's the best way to Just kill to make sure the alligator is gone completely, <laughs> grab the bazooka. Oh, yeah, it's so worth it. I was like, okay, whoa, wait, wait, wait. He's got a bazooka? Was it got a bazooka? He's like, eat this. <laughs> it's so cool. I'm um, going to kick its tail. I wanna... yeah. Honestly, after that description, I want to be whacked by that tail. It's kind of fun. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I've seen better uh, tail whips than that. Um, I believe that's it for my crocodile slash alligator movies I saw because I'm a huge fan of... Oh, there's one more. There's one more, and I have not seen it. I'll just describe it with a title and the description. Robocroc. Ro Robocroc. Robocroc. I was looking at the list and I was like, okay, what what films can I go see? I see this from last year, Robocroc, and I'm like, I am on this like Donkey Kong. Where can I watch this film? I can't. I can't. I can't find it. It's not anywhere. So I looked on the trailer on YouTube, and my God, it is glorious. Um, I gotta see. It. Okay, hold on. There's. I um, need, hold on, hold on. Let me let me check. Um, the trailer does not. Even, the trailer doesn't really give you what's happening. It just shows like the uh, typical monster movie where it's like there's a crocodile on the loose and it's gonna get people at the water park. Yes, the yeah. water a water park. You know, like Piranha 3 dd Um. Yeah, I'm seeing that. So. What happens is that there's this uh, military spacecraft that comes into surface, and on the spacecraft there's these um, uh, nanotech technology, military grade, and it just lands on Earth by Adventure Park, Adventureland, I think it's called, or something, or Venture Park, where it's a amusement park, uh, the largest, uh, what is it, crocodile exhibit, and. Um, it's, it's this huge thing, and it reminded me of Prana 3 dd And these nanobots connected to the host of a prize-winning crocodile named Stella. And I guess when it goes to the host, it turns the host into this robot, I believe? And th then this big robot croc started attacking people, and it's like, where is this movie? I want to see it so bad! <laughs> Oh my God. giant alien robotic reptilicus crocodile? Um are you, are you guys watching the trailer or no? Or I just want to I, I just saw Robocroc fly through a helicopter. <laughs> yep. Exactly. I know, right? Freaking Rush. Robocroft just yeah. jumped. Yeah, yeah, and it's you, you see and you see it in detail. It's, it's actually of like the, the nanotechnology transformed the body into like a real robot crocodile. And he's like, it's I need to get this movie. <laughs> the only thing I can imagine is that it's the prologue, and we see like the alien nanotechnology comes in front of front of like the prize winning crocodile and it just goes in front of it and it says give me your crocs now <laughs> <laughs> no. and and it's funny because it's not alien nanotechs because it's military remind you i said the military spacecraft it's so the military does developed this nanotechnology it kind of reminded me of uh the crocodile hunter collision course where the satellite came down the crocodile ate it you know they have to go chase it but yeah, Robocroc. It's like the best. I even though it's not really a giant monster film, technically, because it's just a nanotechnology attaching to the host of a 
crocodile, but it's but it's listed on the list of Wikipedia. It's like, wait a minute, why are you teasing me with this? It's not a giant monster film. What the heck is it? It's it's a creature feature. It's a giant. It's a um, giant croc. That's what it is. It is. It is. Um, may I add one thing? I think we broke down Morgan. <laughs> right now, he's like system shut down. <laughs> There are so many things wrong with that. <laughs> Am I overjoyed at this movie for some reason? I'm sorry. I, I, I am. This is the most excited I've ever been for a movie. I swear to God. I love robots and I love crocodiles slash alligators. I don't know why. <laughs> and then the crocodile turns into a helicopter. Man... <laughs> um uh, but otherwise uh, I ramble I need to see that hel- I need <laughs> to see that helicopter thing again. It kinda reminds me of how uh, Mega Shark jumped and got that airplane in Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I remember that part, not <laughs> and Crocodile Two where they had the giant crocodile bite down the helicopter. Um, so... Um, another theme... I'm done with crocodiles, by the way, so... Good. Thank you for listening to part one of our retrospective on giant monster films. This beat the Muppets big time. Uh, this is the longest episode ever in Cinema Royal history. I don't think we're gonna beat this one, that's for sure. We beat the record... I think we're done with that. Hopefully next time we won't have a long episode. I mean, it should be normal, hopefully, because the next episode you'll see in part two will be a simple subject. Uh, Anyways, uh, as you can see on the screen here, you can click to check out part uh, two of our episode of um, Giant Monster Films and Godzilla, of course. It... Probably, I would be honest, I think it's my fault, because I rambled about my films that I did my homework on, and I normally ramble anyways, so sorry about that, but you know what? It's all good fun. Um, If you're listening, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, double thank you times a thousand. So yeah, just uh, click on the screen, and you'll be taken to part two. And if you're watching this in the playlist of Cinema Royale, just... Uh, ignore the part two sign and just wait for this video to end, which will be right now. Bye.